Art in New York City. Welcome to this New Drink event. New Drink is our monthly public program series exploring conversations that touch on critical topics, emerging work, and ideas in and around our extended community. These sessions are our way to spotlight an interdisciplinary community of artists, designers, writers, technologists, researchers, and social change advocates in and around New Inc. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome, welcome. Um, New Inc. is a membership program that runs annually and comprises an interdisciplinary cohort of creative people who are looking for connection and professional sustainability, many of them here with us today. Thank you so much for joining. A few notes just to organize us in this virtual space. For now, please keep your mics muted. And uh, when we get to the Q&A portion of our conversation, we'll invite you to unmute and speak. This event has closed captioning enabled. If you'd like to view a live transcript, you can click the CC button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We encourage you to add your pronouns to your name since we're all here seeing each other's little Zoom rectangles. You can do so by clicking the three dots in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom image and selecting rename. Um, and again, since we're sharing space in a conversational atmosphere, highly encourage you to add identifying pronouns. You are welcome to choose camera on or camera off. This event will be recorded and will later be posted to our YouTube page for further viewing. And though we are together virtually today, I'd like to note that I'm joining you from the ancestral unceded lands of the Lenape people. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors past, present and future. By way of introduction, I invite all of you to drop in the chat the ancestral lands that you're joining from. Um, and while you're at it, please feel free to chime in throughout the program in the chat with reflections, thoughts, questions. We like a lively chat at New Inc. So we're here to hear what you have to say. We'll also keep a close eye on all that you're saying to um, ensure that questions are heard by our speakers. Lastly, from me of everywhere that you could be on the internet this evening or this day, depending on where you are, we're really glad that you chose to be here with us. I'll pass over to my colleague, Emma, who will introduce our speakers. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Sore. I'm the Director of Community here at New Inc. And I will turn it to Legacy and Mindy in just a few. Um, but wanted to formally introduce them. Um, Legacy Russell is a writer and curator. She's born and raised in New York City and is the associate curator of exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Russell's first book was released in 2020, Glitch Feminism, what a year to release a book, um, a manifesto from Verso Books. Her academic, curatorial and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, internet, idolatry, and new me media ritual. Her second book, Black Meme, is a recent recipient of the 2021 Creative Capital Awards and is forthcoming via Verso Books. And welcome, Legacy. We're really happy to have you here. And Mindy Sue is a designer and researcher. She began the Cyber Feminism Index in graduate school as an archive of cyber feminism that spans three decades. It's taken many forms, spreadsheet, performative readings, talks, and she was commissioned by Rhizome and presented at the New Museum. Uh, and she's also a New Inc. alum. And she's working on the, the manuscript, sorry, for the cyber feminism catalog to be published in 2022. We are so excited for that, both of your future works. Um, and today we're excited to talk about your current works and share space to explore the boundaries, edges and intersections of the conversations that you all have created uh, and or are continuing in your worlds. They are both glitches in themselves, your works, uh, and they also open worlds to us uh, for the future where there may be many more ways to explore or glitch our ideas of gender, race, embodiment, and I'm really excited for this conversation. I learned this is the first time these two brilliant creators are in conversation together. And so we are totally in for a treat and a lot of learning today. So want to turn it over to you, Mindy, to kick us off. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Emma and Kelsa. And also thank you to Maddie and Stephanie for facilitating this event. And for all of you for pushing through Zoom fatigue and joining us tonight, I'm definitely feeling a Zoom burn, but I'm excited to chat with Legacy. Um, when we were first brainstorming last week, we landed on this quote by Michael Warner from Publix and Counterpublics. Uh, it, he says, a publication is a site where a public is formed. And for those of who haven't read Legacy's book, which I have in front of me, um, Legacy surveys a variety of um, artists and excerpts throughout each chapter. Um, in one of the chapters, Glitch Mobilizes, she writes, in mobilizing, we found others like us, and in doing so, we found ourselves. I actually think that might be a citation from Bufu. Um, but Legacy, I'm wondering if you can talk about publications as a site or a tool for map making. Yeah, I mean, thank you all for being here. It's great to be here with you, Mindy, um, in celebration of your incredible work as well, um, recognizing that what you have created has been a long overdue and necessary resource. Um, so it's an absolute glitch and correction in its own. Um, but this idea of kind of publications as meeting sites, the structure of the book, um, you know, as, as I maybe chatted with you early on, um, was thinking about a way where there could be a different type of presence and kind of convening. Um, the, the opportunity to kind of create this book and have it exist as a place and space um, where many different thinkers from different strands of work and practice and exploration um, could come together and as well um, where that could kind of further discussions about cyber feminism and maybe as well gaps within that history. So um, really that is what the hope is. And I, I think the structure um, is, is in support of that. Well, I'm not sure if any of you went to Legacy's book launch at PS1 last October, I believe, but instead of it being a book reading of, of sorts, Legacy invited an entire panel of guests and it really felt like this decentralized convening of a lot of different examples of what glitch feminism could include. Yeah, I mean, I think that like for that experience, it was really interesting, like the amount of book readings where you go and someone's reading out loud their own text. Like for me, I think that the book itself um, is intended to empower artists to speak for themselves. Um, the hope is that, you know, as that is happening across generations, across histories, um, that, you know, there kind of engages this kind of impossible conversation, right? Because some of the folks obviously are people who are no longer with us. And some of those um, folks are of course um, alive and in the world and actively working. And so to think about a way where those people can share a table um, and suss out methodologies and have that be something that um, is politically informed felt really necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I especially liked for the Cyber Feminism Index also, trying to figure out a way to highlight this multiplicity of different voices mm -hmm. in the index itself, each blurb is an excerpt of a pre-written text. So by browsing through, you really do see a sense of hundreds of different people. Right, and, absolutely. And we were also talking about um, within this map make or this map of this other space, how do you actually guide in someone who's new to this thing? Mm -hmm. I think I've definitely heard from Cyber Fem Index that it can be quite daunting to approach this very austere index. So on the collections page, Legacy actually curated one of these, but I asked different people to curate 10 to 20 entries to basically almost act like a tour guide and show like what readings were relevant for their own practices that were situated in subjective uh, narratives of what cyber femme or glitch feminism or xenofem might mean to those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I think what's kind of interesting about that is as well allowing for a kind of dispersion of knowledge, like recognizing that there really is no um, centralized meeting point and that as well, the ways in which maybe this history can be reshaped um, is actively putting that work, that care, um, that vision um, into the hands of other folks who are actively engaging with that as a, as a presence, right? Asking for the people who are kind of living in the digital to do that work. So I really love that about your index. And I think that the language of index, of course, um, engages, you know, troubles, right? It's like something that is a taxonomy, it's super raced, it's gendered, it's classed. Um, so there is something that I think is really um, complicated and volatile by calling it an index. And then too, Mindy, the way in which you refuse that, right? Allowing for it to take on a different shape. Yeah, I, what's also this idea of the index and trying to break existing forms or conventions, um, legacy and I thought, 
this was also surrounding naming culture and naming conventions. So within the index itself, initially in the spreadsheet version, there was this large taxonomy of all these different terms um, that these things could be categorized underneath. But this was only seeming to reinforce this uh, exterior identification of what these things might be. So then do people self-identify who are we to kind of name what people might um, be part of? Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of um, Haley Lohman from the Autonomous Oral History Group. She says that for her, their keywords, you, they only use direct transcripts of what someone has actually said in an interview. So mm -hmm. it's not to make assumptions. Yeah, I mean, I think that the ways in which naming operates with English feminism is really important. Um, thinking about to the complex histories that names trigger for Black people, queer people, um, you know, the ways in which names have been given to us, right, against our will, the names in which, um, you know, maybe have been lost along the way, um, the names that we claim, right, so as to kind of self-identify and that that is an act of empowerment um, and kind of active decolonization, um, you know, of a kind of bodily trauma too, um, I think is really important. And so, you know, for me, the empowerment of that feels like a really necessary component of something to consider within this idea of the index, right? But also to the ways in which, you know, an index can be a manifesto in its own um, and that it, you know, establishes um, new ways to kind of uh, engage with the world's order and to think about the fact that actually within that, um, you know, some of the logics of our ordering actually are deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your in your chapter, Glitches Errors, I'm just going to read a few excerpts because the writing of the text <laughs> is so beautiful. Um, but you say the body is a text. And every time we define ourselves, we choose these names that reduce the ways our bodies can be read. And I think that is such a powerful and empowering way of trying to reclaim this act of naming and really embrace like the, you call it the poetic elasticity that refuses the name as static or definitive. Mm. I mean, I, I, I want to um, maybe think about this idea of naming in, in intersection with this question of the syllabus, right? Because I know that, Mindy, as we've chatted, you've reflected uh, about, you know, what this index can do, right? And, and the ways in which, um, you know, a kind of pedagogy is built into this uh, and thinking through, too, that, um, you know, in this question of names is also, you know, a kind of teaching and learning that there's an active exchange there um, that can be possible um, and participatory, really, um, when we think of different publics. And so, I, I, you know, I'm wondering to hear you maybe reflect a little bit about um, the ways in which you are hoping for this material to be shaped. Obviously, you're creating this meeting point, right, of this publication that will come, um, which we're all looking forward to. But then, too, thinking about, you know, the meeting points that maybe you have not even realized, right, that actually that, you know, I'm thinking about glitch feminism, that part of the work of this as a book was it arriving in the world and seeing how other people really were using it. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about what that experience has been like? Because I know it has traveled far from its origin site. Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you visited the site, um, as you click through different entries, these things are added to the side panel, which with Angeline Meitzler, who I'm not sure if she's here, and Janine Rosen, my collaborators, um, you basically get this side panel trail. It builds all these associations of what you're clicking and opening. And these are all then available for download. And this download was kind of meant to be a reader or a pseudo syllabus, or perhaps some sort of annotated bibliography. And generally, I, I like the act of piracy. I'm very pro-piracy. Um, Paul Soelis talks about the download as a political act. Mm -hmm. especially in this time when everything is so disseminated. Um, so I think in that way, it's a very literal packet that people can claim ownership over or try to personalize in some way. Mm -hmm. but I also think from the tagging or naming side, trying to think of different working groups so people can uh, contribute their own naming structures or even submit their own entries. This mm -hmm. is largely a crowdsource index. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, that the... Um kind of language of a kind of a counter narrative maybe is the best way of putting it um, is a possibility within your project and my own thinking about the ways in which that kind of storytelling can be possible but also that actually um, you know which is 
perhaps counter to what we are often um, told and what is shown to us that, you know, folks from diasporic histories can speak while they're still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, for me, it feels really necessary to think about this question of a syllabi and the materials that these kind of tags, right, as this organic material, um, these things that are, you know, living with us that can speak and push back um, and, you know, can sort of wrestle with us too. That feels really important um, as opposed to having it happen, you know, in a moment where those folks are no longer in the room with us. Mm -hmm. Well, and to think of like this pedagogical framework that's really built on social learning, mm -hmm. not this person, one person kind of speaking to a group, but rather trying to create and specifically name the rules of a decentralized hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. In your closing chapter, I believe, you uh, introduced this word careful but it's spelled C-A-R-E dash full, F-U-L-L, -L, full of care. And I love this as a framework to kind of think about how we gather things and what that assembly of objects actually means. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say, like I've told you a little bit about, you know, just my experience in graduate school. I think that I'm definitely not alone, you know, as I talk to folks who have gone through the graduate school experience or really any institutional learning experience, right? Be it, you know, within a school properly or, you know, a sort of structure of an institution. There are so many tripwires and triggers and traumas, um, you know, as someone who is, you know, coming from a background that is intersectional, right? Um, you know, when you are inside of those spaces, often there are these weird disassociations moments um, where you are quite literally watching uh, around you and reading things and taking on things as if you are the theory, you are, you know, kind of like embodied as a theory um, instead of, you know, uh, basically being fully seated in your body um, and being able to speak from your lived experience as a site of knowledge. So, you know, for me, it was a really interesting experience being in graduate school. And, you know, I was in the process of working my dissertation and thinking about about you know, what it means to really like present within an academy setting. Um, and alongside of that kind of creating this project, um, you know, and, and beginning to do some of this writing, um, which, you know, in early days was published um, by Rhizome. Um, and, you know, thinking through the outlets for that without really thinking about what the audience was other than recognizing that the audience was myself, right? It was me, it was the community that I was operating in um, and trying to maybe write for that first, right? Um, and I think, that, you know, this idea of careful, um, you know, it, it was necessary because I, you know, recognize that those experiences of, of being maybe in institutional learning spaces um, that are often very clumsy, that can enact certain types of violences, um, you know, that um, engage a pedagogy that conceptualizes ourselves um, in a way that is so rarefied that we're rendered unrecognizable to who we are. Um, and so part of this too is an exercise about how do we kind of give our thought back to ourselves, right? And not just become theories. And that, you know, as an exercise that that feels like something that is a really worthy uh, mode of empowerment. Yeah, it really makes me think of um, uh, imposter syndrome being, uh, the burden is then placed on the individual for them mm -hmm. to feel like they are not good enough to be in this space. When in fact, imposter syndrome is really a systematic form of oppression in which you're meant to feel excluded and then feel like you then have to prove yourself or make space for yourself or your community when in fact, it was really, never really intended for that person to begin with. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will say it's like funny because I like, you know, club culture is like a first entry point for my love of performance and new media and and as well feminisms right and so it's really interesting because when you know in graduate school when you're studying performance there are certain texts that you read and it's like okay we're focusing on these different um subcultures right and and actually these are spaces that you know you, when you are in them they do not even appear to be this sort of marginal subculture. So this idea of, you know, what that is and, and what happens like when you create a meeting site as a book, right? Or as a publication um, is only a part of that, right? It's also about the language that you're, you know, interacting with and engaging and, and um, the sort of um, ease of um, use, right? That you're thinking of 
when you're engaging different audiences, which I know that you've done with the index, thinking about the ways in which um, the people who are intended to use it, the reason why it was built in the first place, right, can make use of it and have it feel organic and natural to them. And that I think is something that is a really generous part of the index, um, you know, and is my great hope, right, too, for what glitch feminism can continue to do, right? I'm not as interested in it being something for um, every single person. I'm interested in it being for um, the folks who looked for themselves in these different spaces, myself included, and couldn't see themselves there. Absolutely. Um in these earlier essays of glitch feminism, which I believe were like 2013, so a good amount of time ago, you actively push against this notion of the subaltern. Mm. And I think this term subaltern, subculture, sub anything gives roots to where the point of origin is coming from. Something is only othered if you actually feel like you're part of this normative or uh, predominant space. Mm. And I think that we also talked about um, Angela Davis's notion of like radical edges, how if you feel like if to first of all, try to make something so revolutionary that it's seductive and that the mainstream wants to kind of encompass this. And once they do to constantly push yourself more and more to this outskirt in order to build the bounds of what this canon or breaking down the structure might look like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I laugh because there was a you know, there have been many moments over the course of this book existing in the world, and you know, I'm sure you've had your own experiences with this, where people I think um, who are in technology get really excited about you know what it means to have this book exist, and um, a lot of these folks are you know white cisgendered men, and and they're writing and they're saying, oh, it's really great to talk about this, and um, you know, it would be great if you could if you could write write us you know, some history, right? And you know, coming back to them with questions about what that is, you know, asking them to define that. And really they're just asking for a sort of continuation of what they already know, right? Rather than hearing things that actually are departures from that. So this is this interesting navigation too of what radical history really can be. Because, you know, as we put these texts into the world, I think it's also about how we protect them um, and the material of them, right? We can't control every part of that, but, you know, I, there have been real um, deep moments of reckoning and trying to think of, um, you know, the, the intention behind this, right? And that there are a lot, I think, of kind of extractive questions um, tied to the possibilities of, of, you know, the way that this could labor for someone who it is not intended for, um, that that actually in and of itself is something that, you know, as a responsibility to the text and to the work, um, you know, we have to actively work against. Right. I'm reminded of this phrase, the explanatory comma, mm -hmm. in which when you describe something, uh, that for a particular group is very obvious, but then you take a moment to explain it to a larger group, <laughs> yes. it indicates to the primary or the the intended group that this is actually not for them. This mm. is a watered down uh, explanatory version for this other group. And I think when you're on the other side of that, it's such a hurtful thing to see something that you resonate with that you then realize is actually not for you to be good with. Right. I mean, I think that like the goal is to turn those commas inside out, right? Like, however that's possible, um, I want to live in that space because it just feels like that, you know, as you said, that some of these things, the kind of um, asides, right, that we use to justify or kind of um, qualify different um, experiences and theory and thought um, are definitely sites of deep, deep trauma, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and that actually the, there are bodies embedded there. There are people who live in those spaces. And so, you know, uh, me being one of those people, I feel very much so that it's an exciting opportunity to think actively about, you know, the, the moments where um, some of our learning has failed um, and to think through, you know, who within the histories of cyber feminism, you know, has remained most prominent and visible and asking why that might be. Mm -hmm. uh, and to to think through too the ways in which our visibility, because you know, as female identified people, you know, the ways that we are visible or not in this process and project um, becomes also part of the conversation and has to be, um, I would say, handled responsibly. Absolutely. Um, I want to turn to you though, Mindy. Oh, sure. <laughs> ask you actually, you know, because I know that we've spoken about the histories of design, right? And I feel like um, 
like for example, an incredible designer worked on uh, the cover of Glitch Feminism, Elizabeth Carp Evans. Um, for those of you who are gonna go to Printed Matters Book Fair, you should check out um, her digital booth. Um, but um, with that, you know, I, I will have to say that it is a complicated history, the history of design. And so, you know, being a person of color who is working um, kind of to think about the way to um, engage with those hierarchies and through these histories of cyber feminism, I was wondering if you maybe could talk a little bit about you know, the way that you put this material together. Um, what are some of the decisions that, that you have to make or consider as you're recognizing what can be uh, made visible, maybe, or not? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what those tensions are, or maybe decisions have to be? Yeah, I think that designing the framework for facilitation is really complicated. And I feel like you're forced to uh, return to it and question it and pick at it over and over and over. I don't think that these rules are meant to be steadfast. So when I was first starting, it was really through bibliographies, reading a lot of academic articles and scraping mm -hmm. their bibliographies and footnotes. But then you really do feel like the type of uh, content you're getting is very veered towards academic audiences. And that seems very counterintuitive to what CyberFam actually includes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the inspirations was also this book called The New Woman's Survival Catalog. It was billed as the feminist whole earth catalog in the early 1970s. And when they were creating it at Columbia, uh, their advisor told them that a revolution could never happen in an institution, you had to go grassroots. Mm -hmm. So they basically took a road trip across the US and talked to a bunch of people and created this catalog of resources that really does feel like a nice slice of second wave feminism in the US. Um, but that title, I think, is really, really uh, valuable for me, this idea of sharing as survival. Mm -hmm. um, so even then, even if I was talking, uh, even though I started with academic articles, by then talking with as many people as possible, you start to compile various artists, various hacker spaces, all of these things that don't necessarily have secondary sources. And why should they have need secondary sources to be validated? Absolutely. Like, um, yeah. Something like Wikipedia or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So again, just pointing back to the question of audience, who is it for? Right. I mean, I love that. And they, but pulling out, I guess, a few things, this idea of footnotes, right? But also this sort of necessity of survival, right? Like, I feel like with glitch feminism, like I wrote myself into life, you know, like just being as in sort of vivified, right? Um, and, and that actually being able to um, sustain oneself is also about holding space for others and thinking through the ways in which like we are um, creating space to celebrate our life, right? Quite literally, like in our day to day and the lives of each other as, you know, bearing witness to one another and that that actually is the source, right? It's the, the sort of witnessing and participation that allows for that um, kind of verification um, that, you know, I, I think within a kind of academic setting and tradition obviously requires um, a different type of process, right? And that that process actually maybe is inauthentic to what it means to be human in the world. Um, so, you know, I love that you're kind of mentioning this question of survival because surviving is a really big part of both of these projects. And as well, you know, this notion of the footnote and the footnote as a space and a site of occupation. Um, mm -hmm. There was a period of time where um, I laughed because I think I saw Mackenzie Wark in the room um, who is just an incredible amazing woman um, who has been such a force behind, um, you know, kind of guiding me through different chapters of thinking about this process. But, um, you know, Mackenzie and I both have the same editor. And I remember writing to my editor and, and sending a version of both feminism early on. And, and uh, you know, the response came back basically saying that, this is all footnotes, right? And so we had this like negotiation of footnotes, right? And and I, we got to a good place because, you know, for me, the conversation about what the footnote can be, right? Like that, as in that there was such a volume of text that was in the footnote, in addition to as well, the actual text. Um, and so, you know, questioning what that does to the legibility and of, of the text, right? That, you know, is there an opportunity to be strategic in placing footnotes and rendering a text um, illegible um, in a certain way that it requires people 
able to do a certain type of um, seeking as they are participating in it, right? That it it has to be super active and present. And I do feel like that um, with the incredible index that you've created, that the sort of material of the footnote does some of that. It allows for us to have to kind of like do some hunting um, and participate, which, you know, feels um, really important and allows too for a different type of interaction with the material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that footnotes as a writing style is such a beautiful strategy because it really does give a glimpse into the process of compiling these things Mm -hmm. and situating it in these these subjective narratives. Yeah, Uh, I think the best footnoter is Adrienne Marie Brown. The Mm -hmm. way she (laughs) cites other people is unparalleled, I think. Mm -hmm. She'll say like, oh, I thought of this thing while I was sitting in a lecture for this person. It doesn't yeah. even have to be, it's like a recollection device. It's quite right. Nice. I mean, I think that a lot of memory lives in footnotes. And so, you know, as well, like rejecting maybe what a footnote is supposed to do, right? Like that it's actually not a kind of a uh, side note, right? That actually Absolutely. people can confuse what that um, sort of real estate is as a, a site um, and think through differently the ways in which it can serve the, the text and, and support it and quite literally hold it up, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it was just as important to me to have um, an awareness of, of who was in there um, in addition to, of course, who um, is you know, kind of in the text and, and how those things are entangled and intertwined was uh, an opportunity to make things volatile and a little sticky. Yeah, and I also like this idea of footnotes or other ways of dissecting texts because uh, in the Cyberfem Index, I really, really try to incorporate as many cross references as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, to kind of reduce the hierarchy. Like, yes, it's chronological or alphabetical or however you sort it, but by uh, creating cross references, you're almost encouraging nonlinear reading. You're Mm -hmm. putting things in voice with each other, whether it's juxtaposed or in support of. And I think it does fortify these different things because we're not saying everyone has the same opinion. It's trying to bring everyone into the same space and uh, kind of agreeing to disagree or show a survey of different modes of thought. Yeah, I mean, that lack of linearity is something that I get really jazzed about because as well, um, the way I read, like, you know, I often will take ages to get through different parts of a text because I'll get really embedded in a certain sentence and some of the definitions and things that are sort of part of that sentence and the names that are there. So you just follow all these different rabbit holes, right? Um, And that that actually is a really um, beautiful and ecstatic experience. It's a slow experience. It encourages us to do something different um, with the material and, you know, for um, the the presence of this index, right? And thinking about what a print publication can do. And as well, thinking of good feminism that, you know, to have material that is slow material in a fast medium, right? That answers to a fast medium, that actually we are constantly engaged with so much on our screens, especially now, um, that it becomes a different kind of luxury to think about ways to break up aspects of that linearity, to engage with different hierarchies, to have it be something that can be abstracted and nonlinear, and that that can be um, a way to kind of wander. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are things that I think that as a pleasure right now are really necessary and can be really radical and revolutionary. Definitely. I'm curious though, um, I was recently reviewing David Reinford's definition of hard copy versus soft copy. Mm. And I think the hard copy is quite nice because you have this like fixed tome or a reference point for the future. But the soft copy, the digital translation is always updated, um, is constantly changing, is constantly. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you imagine a soft copy for glitch feminism or some variation. I mean, I think it like happens kind of organically. There is like a digital copy that you can get, which is great and awesome. Um, And, you know, I I imagine that the text will be living in that way and that it may change shape and form over time. Um, So I'm not opposed to that. I've been very sort of liberal, probably should not say this, but like in sharing out parts of the text with people too, because for me, um, you know, I'm less interested, like I said, in having it be something that has to be housed within kind of a singular space or site, but rather that, you know, if people want it and they want to learn with it and they want to talk about it, that that it should be their right. Um, So, you know, for me, a lot of that was built into actually the design of the book. Like, you know, this material of it um, was something that was deeply considered. One of the things that I had thought about 
early on is that I really wanted it to go, you know, into a back pocket. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's such a weird demand, right? Like, why does that matter? But I actually think it's super important because what it means is that people can carry it with them. Um, and I think that like some of the design of books, especially books that engage theory have gotten bigger and bigger more and more expensive and they're super heavy. Um, and so you can't carry them with you anywhere. Um, and even if you try, right, it becomes almost an impossible task. So, you know, the idea of a book that lives with you and that can kind of be housed anywhere um, and hopefully can kind of be weathered over time, right? You can kind of go back to it um, is a, a thing that, you know, becomes really important in this idea of hard and soft. For sure. And Indeed. the first thing I actually noticed was, oh, someone yeah um i want to include our community in this conversation as oh, well please. I feel like um, going on. <laughs> yeah i love it i think we all want <laughs> it's been incredible i feel like it's more of a double dutch like and i'm jumping in the ropes you know a little bit here so it's uh i'll bring in some of the questions that we've been getting in the chat um and as we move into that i just want to say this is uh, thank you for holding these stories. I can't imagine the process of, of holding all of this and then the generosity to share it with all of us. And so I see you, we see you, and we are so grateful for the work that you have done. Um, and so want to move it into the first question. Um, so this one's for legacy. Um, in the first chapter of your book, you write that the glitch is an error a mistake, a failure to function? What happens when a glitch becomes something beautiful? Does it remain an error? I mean, I think it's a great question, but I, I you know, with all due respect, I think it's Zaina, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I, maybe there's a um, ideological and fundamental difference that I am taking as a position about what an error is. I actually don't think that um, the aesthetic concern of an error um, is the priority when I am thinking about the way it can work within this text. I'm not um, thinking about an error as a, a thing that is named as being ugly, um, quite the contrary. And so um, I, I'm concerned about the language of, of beauty because for me that feels unjust and violent Island. Um, you know, the, the work um, that needs to be done is thinking about, you know, the fact that actually so much of beauty has been shaped around the wrong paradigms. Um, and so taking back some of that to think about what it means to redefine for ourselves, right, um, that actually, um, you know, what beauty is and, you know, who is considered beauty, beautiful and what that power can be um, is problematic um, and is deeply, you know, sexist, it's racist, it's homophobic, it's ableist, you know, it's all of those things. Things, right. So for me, I'm um, hoping that people can occupy the space of error as being a strategy, right, and a way to to kind of see ourselves differently. Um, and Mindy, uh, could you talk in about more detail in your intentions for the audience and your original goals for the index and how those translated into UI and design? Yeah, I think that, again, because the project has evolved so much, um, the Cyber Feminism Index website, um, Angeline and I had a lot of, had several talks about how websites age and how we might future proof to the best of our ability and also how we can visualize citations. Um, so this is very much connected to legacy in my banter about footnotes and cross references and things of this nature. Um, I'm really, really trying to make it feel like an annotated bibliography, kind of similar to Lucy Lepard's Six Years. So it's a chronology of different excerpts of different voices, um, but a, there's still a, a weaving of what I think are various through lines as a facilitator or as a gatherer. Uh, and we can dissect that word too. Um, but in terms of future proofing, I think because I've done so much work in websites and digital media, I've seen the web degrade really, really quickly. But if you look at a lot of indexes that are featured in Cyberfem Index or a lot of websites, these sites were static sites, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and they're still there three decades later. Um, maybe they're- I back. love them. I think they're great. <laughs> I think they're great. Every time I hear of a Craigslist redesign, I'm like, Leave Craigslist. I that. I'm like, don't do this to Craigslist. We don't need that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. And it's actually funny because I it like in my sort of like 
archiving of digital things. I have some printouts that are just in my papers um, that I keep of like, you know, the OG Craigslist sites. And um, I, I'm like so glad that I have them because I just think the audacity of trying to make everything kind of exist in a sense of kind of sameness. For so sure. I appreciate the texture, Mindy, that you're talking about. Yeah, I think that this idea of like trying to make something feel not old. It's not trying to be nostalgic. It's trying to be kind of timeless. Like if you looked at this through any point in time, it's just a standard index. And then by doing so, there are certain interactive things that we can try to unpack what standard or default might mean and why that's a problem. So the site really comes alive as you move around, color appears, highlights appear, things of this nature. Um, but for in terms of audience, it really is for anyone who I've kind of had a breadth of people, scholars, definitely artists, but also I kind of wanted to make it for like the teen person who is trying to find this weird stuff online and everything looks the same and they stumble upon this like tomb of work that suddenly introduces this whole suite of things that they never imagined. Um, but again, entry points, trying to make sure it's accessible, all of these things are all questions. And then one sort of zooming out a little bit and thinking about glitch feminism and cyber feminism about and the future, how do you think it changes the future of feminism? Wow, that's a big question. Big. I zoomed out. <laughs> I mean, it is a big question. I don't know. I guess, you know, it is a short answer. I think that um, we're standing in the center of some of those changes and it's, it would be foolish to try to augur the future right now. At least that's where I'm at. Um, I can say that like, you know, what this was in 2013 when some of this began, right? Like I, now that I am standing in some version of future from that point, um, I can absolutely not have imagined that this work would have had the travel that it has, right? It's gone to the most weird and amazing spots, um, if only because um, people have really used it. Like it has become something that people have used and enacted and performed to and, you know, participated in. It's become like really something um, that so many different people have touched. And so for me, the hope would be that that continues. Um, you know, if that is a possibility, then that for me is like a really positive and generative contribution to what this future could be. Mm -hmm. And there's a question, um, two questions sort of different, but related to academia and the institution of graduate school. Um, of the first part of it, I'm gonna squish two together is how do you personally cope and reconcile with the tension between academic writing and more accessible localized writing? And then also we have a call for any words uh, for folks who are black queer in the in, thick in the trauma of grad school. So maybe you can approach that how you want to. Hmm. Mindy, do you have some thoughts? I mean, I, I guess I'll say that um, to the first question, it's complicated, right? Because I do think like books like Glitch Feminism as they have traveled into highly academic spaces, um, one of the primary points of response that people have said about the book to me, which for me has been such a um, honor to hear, right, is that people are enjoying it, that they can read it, that they're, you know, participating in it and understand it, right, that like they are able to see themselves in it in different ways that that is something that should be possible within most academic texts. And I think that the trouble is, is that, you know, when we are existing in academic spaces and, you know, this is someone who I am an academic as someone embedded in art history, right? Um, we have to do a lot of active kind of um, decolonizing and as well, maybe at points like sort of uh, unpeeling of really what it is that we're trying to do when we talk about art in particular, um, but you know, really any subject as you're studying it within an institutional setting. I had to do so many different versions of this book um, as I tried to find out what that voice was. And it was really, really incredibly hard, um, largely because I was working on a dissertation at the same time. And the message for what that was, was completely the opposite, like the absolute polar opposite. Mm -hmm. So this for me became like the, my 
my place to curl up, right? It was a place that was like safe and felt, you know, like that I had to write it because it was as Mindy noted, right? Like a survival place um, to kind of work through some of that. But I will say that, you know, my hope is too, that, that in some of these things, the discussion of this language of decolonizing that within academic spaces, it can be more possible to have different types of languages present that allow for um, readership to be um, engaged in a way that is more intersectional um, and doesn't necessarily classify language um, you know, in a, a form that is so violent. Right, I definitely think that to build upon that, academic writing is a skin. Um, I think it's a skin that you put on so when other academics read it, they know the audience or they know they are the audience. Yeah, a skin but, is a defense mechanism, I feel absolutely. like. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I actually love that uh, as something like glitch feminism enters the academic circuit, it doesn't have to use that skin and it doesn't require a translator. And yet it can still be analyzed with whatever academic frameworks you want. Um, but I, I do think it's important to have these texts that kind of move between different disciplines or else it just gets siloed. And I think that's a huge loss. I mean, I guess to the question of like being a, a black person navigating um, like studies, it is deeply traumatic. I think like, you know, we, it's traumatic in ways sometimes where we don't even fully understand and maybe you're not. And this is, you know, I, I would say an experience that extends beyond my blackness, right? There are many people who have this experience too. Um, but I would say, you know, as a black person working within the arts, right? And engaging um, as a part of the mission of my work, right? Talking to black people who are creators and makers um, that people feel so often alienated in these spaces. And the fact that that is coming from people who are deeply accomplished, like, you know, you would never imagine, right? And then folks who are emerging artists is shocking. And quite frankly, it speaks to the fact that there's more work to be done. So, you know, I do feel that, um, you know, the goal of, of our studies is not necessarily to feel safe every single day, right? Like as in we, we can be rattled, we can have moments where we feel uncomfortable, right? But it shouldn't feel dangerous. Um, I think there's a distinction there, right? Like feeling like that we are entering into places of real harm um, is a, as an ongoing point um, is something that, you know, we really need to continue to revisit. And I think that part of that too is thinking about, you know, where we're um, allowing ourselves maybe to not be convinced that some of our perspectives and experiences in those spaces are not real because mm -hmm. they are. Um, and I think that, you know, academia does a lot sometimes to encourage us to not feel or react to those things. Um, and then we have a question. We've had such a wide ranging conversation. Um, and so we have a question also about the front cover of the book. <laughs> and I'm gonna add on to it about the colors of um, the Cyber Feminism Index. What role does color or the cover design sort of play? How did you, how did you decide on those things? I'll be very brief. Mindy, I feel like you should talk about design because I'm not a designer, but I will shout out the designer of this book. Um, Elizabeth Carp Evans of Pacific, um, you know, which is amazing um, small publisher doing incredible work uh, with artists. And this is like, it, you know, as someone who is a designer, she brought her vision to this and thought deeply about as well. I think some of the um, the different histories, Mindy, that you spoke of, right, that are like almost of, of a kind of uh, retro, as you know, we look back at different versions of what we think about um, in the aesthetic of a kind of feminism and of, of computing too. So mm -hmm. there's that that's embedded in it, and I, and as well, like I said, with the the kind of scale of it, that that was something that was very particular. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll keep this short also. Yes, I'm a designer, but I also really like obvious design decisions. And I think RGB green <laughs> is a very obvious decision, feels very cyborgian. Um, I also think that when you're thinking about alt text, it's really nice to use very basic CSS color names. And if you write green, it'll read as green rather than hashtag six unit hex code. So that was a subtle decision also. Love it. Are there any folks who have questions they want to verbalize um, out loud? We also have time for a few more in the chat. Uh, 
Um, one of the things you all mentioned was sort of your work taking on forms well outside of what you could imagine. Um, I'm wondering if there are any that you can share that have been especially delightful for you um, or just one example that surprised you or delighted you. In terms of, can you repeat that? Is it how the, the work has lived in the world? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I've gotten great mail, like really amazing mail. And I, I, I don't know, you know, that has been something that is great and only possible because the internet allows that to be possible. You know, with me being at the city museum, people are aware city museum has an, a mailing address, right? Um, so I have had the most surprising and incredible mail um, about just um, ways in which people are are translating glitch, like literally translating it, but also as well, turning it into newspapers, art objects, like thinking about it actively. And for me too, I see um, folks talking about ways to work through creativity in the chat, that that actually has been an incredible thing to see because it, it reminds me that this work is deeply somatic. Um, it's something that you know requires people to touch things and to feel things, to think about the ways that they are able to, to read it. Right, um, and that that actually, as an instinct, is something that we lose touch with so quickly as we come into our adulthood. Right, like this idea of being a mature person is like we almost um, divorce that instinct from ourselves. Um, so it has been this amazing thing watching people um, and their willingness to play with the material, um, and you know, to have it be spliced and you know, excerpted and made into their own thing, um, and having those things pop up in unexpected places has been a really amazing gift. And conversation. I feel like mine is less delightful than legacy is snail mail. I think, please send me snail mail about cyber time and death. <laughs> so <laughs> cool, especially because I'm like, all these people love the internet, but they're also loving snail mail. Exactly, like, right. We're cool, like yeah. <laughs> great. So, you know, that is like an intersection is something I think too, that like, you know, debunk some mythologies about what the digital is. Everybody thinks, you know, we're trying to, you know, end print, right? And that actually is a whole other set of things to discuss, maybe a debate for part two. Um, but I just love that crossroads. For sure. I mean, mail art is a proto-internet. There's a lot of writing about how this yes, kind of tons. network is. Literally. Mm -hmm. um, something delightful from mine. I think on a lighter note, it's been really nice to see people finding themselves or their friends in the index. And in addition, it's also been nice when people say, oh, I'm disappointed this wasn't in there. I feel like this has been omitted because the very first line of the about in the manifesto, it says this index is incomplete and always in progress. So I actually quite like being challenged and called out, but just be nice about it. Um, but the whole goal is for this to be an ongoing growing space. So as cyberfem changes, as we kind of continue to dig deeper into these histories, I would think it would be wonderful if all these things could be eventually added into the, the index. There's a submit button, so please send it there. My inbox is intimidating. Um, to, it, oh. I was gonna say to just join on that, um, this idea that you all explored for, um, for a while about additions through footnotes, um, there's a question about how what you have created is a form of interaction or can be a form of interaction by the individuals reading or experiencing the information and how you all are conceiving of, of that interaction. I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, I will try is that, you know, I, I guess what you're saying is like that it's, di it's dictated by how people are entering the text. Is that correct, Emma? Um, I would love, uh, Rhonda, do you feel comfortable sharing or clarifying your question? Yeah, um, thank you all for this conversation. It's been incredible. Um, I guess I was just kind of curious about when you were talking about footnotes, how have you thought about maybe communal footnotes, like the additions that the um, individuals engaging with that information, just like maybe as a future thought? Yes. I mean, I, I actually am thrilled for it. And I also have loved moments where people have added their own additional notes to the notes. Like one of the weird and amazing things, and I call it weird, but I, I use weird often 
because of the things that I love, just to clarify, um, defining our terms. But I, one of the amazing things that's happened is that people have sent me um, pictures of them marking the book up. Mm-hmm. And that is really important, right? I think that like for me, that's something that I do often with all different types of texts. It's a form of occupation. Um, I mean, I literally remember the first time I read A Thousand Plateaus and I was like, excuse my French, F this book. I'm so mad at this book, right? But I literally like got in there with my pen and paper and was like, I'm going to get involved with this text and kind of talk back to it and show it what it can do for me, right? So some of that as an instinct is like a really important thing. And so I absolutely do really, um, Randa, to your question, um, hope for that. I hope that there are opportunities for that. And I also have been so thrilled as well for people to stumble upon themselves. Like obviously all the artists are aware, right? That they're in this book, but for all the citations, right? You know, as much as I tried to kind of like share this with the folks who were cited, um, it, you know, is one of those things that often is a discovery too. So people seeing other people cited and kind of pointing that out has been a really amazing thing to kind of call into the community and have people kind of central in that um, as a process as well too. And I have to say this, while people are living and alive in the world, which is really amazing and important and feels really necessary, especially given all that has continued to happen. Mm -hmm. Vivian, do you wanna jump in here? You have your hand raised, Vivian. Hi, Um, yeah, I just really love this theme um, or topic about footnotes um, and just the communal aspect and how sort of like um, giving credit and where you source your ideas and and kind of going against this sort of like hoarding of intellectual property that I think I see happening. Um, So I'm wondering like if you guys, like I think footnotes are sort of within this context of written uh, written mediums or written theory, perhaps. Um, I'm wondering if you guys envision this footnote mentality in other mediums that aren't necessarily written, or if there's any examples of that sort of mentality that you've seen in already happening in non-written uh, spaces. Immediate examples don't come to mind, but I'm currently part of this group called CSS with Laura Combs and Laurel Schwulz, and we've been thinking about the multidimensional citation. And we're writing a paper about this right now. But I think that typically when you cite someone in an academic context, you're almost like legitimizing what you're writing and how you're adapting it. Um, But we're trying to think about multidimensional all citations across time and space. So you're citing someone from the past and incorporating into the present, but how can you also then determine or suggest how you would like to be cited in the future? Um, And this is a link that I haven't necessarily seen in a lot of works, maybe not explicitly, but implicitly. I also think that building associations between two disparate things is a form of authorship. So I don't, First of all, I don't think any idea is brand new. Um, I'm very pro multi-authorship. But I think that does start to get at what citations could be and how citations could be a practice for everyday life outside of writing. Yeah, I mean, I guess like it was interesting, the hashtag glitch feminism maybe has become the ultimate citation. It's been something that has been applied everywhere sometimes in moments where I'm like not happy about this, but I'll, you know, it's interesting to see. Um, And so, you know, I note as well that in that existing, right, that that also is a form where people are trying to navigate ways of um, of illustrating or naming or making different types of space for what this text does, what it has meant to them, the ways in which they see it in the world. Um, So, you know, I've tried to be as chill about it as possible. There've been a few moments where I've been like, okay, upset DM here, but you know, on the whole, I think I've, I've, I've managed it with, with some care. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like that really is relevant to Mindy's point about kind of, um, expressing how you would like to be cited in the way you cite things as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, I think it's, it's helpful when those things happen to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that if, if you write, if someone writes to you or you, you know, write to somebody else and you're like, I feel uncomfortable with this. Like, I don't know if, you know, and, and actually maybe it's just a feeling, right? 
perhaps it's something that maybe you're not even wholly convinced on yourself, but you're expressing that as an instinct. Um, you know, I think that the, the feminist work um, that is collective in navigating that is really important. Um, and so, you know, this idea, I've been thinking a lot about the idea that often, like, I think kind of like white male genius lives alone, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this, this archetype of it, they're in the studio, they're alone, right? But then like, I think the thing that's really remarkable and incredible about, um, you know, kind of a black queerhood um, and as well, like what a cyber feminism is, is that it's deeply collective and that it, it is citational, right? It like allows for so much richness to embed itself there. Um, and so that actually is a really complex and networked form of genius that mm -hmm. you know, is really important to identify. For sure. Um, an early cyber feminist, Susanna Passanen, she says, connectivity has been called the genius of feminism. And I wholeheartedly agree. And just a quick side note about the hashtag. If we're talking about analog uh, precursors, the hashtag used to be a marker for a town square. So as an aggregator, it's quite powerful. You have a central place where you broadcast and all the neighborhoods surround it. Um, and I love that it's been adapted into more of a digital space. Um, Olivia, your virtual. I was hand. literally gonna say, I was like, Emma, can I call on someone? Yeah. Olivia, hi. Yes, let's transport <laughs> wherever Olivia is because it looks beautiful. Oh, I'm in a backyard right now. <laughs> um, my question was, I don't know, I was really struck. I think Legacy was the one, and I I showed up a bit late, and I'm a bit sad about that because I'm in a different time zone. I didn't realize what 5 p.m. meant. Um, I was really struck when Legacy spoke to this kind of like somatic understanding of glitch feminism um, and kind of thinking about feeling as a form of, of thinking. Um, and in my personal like academic journey, there's been a lot of starts and stops. So as an undergrad, I spent most more time outside of school than in it. Um, and my kind of main form of education has been, yeah, reading and writing and lots of feeling. And so my question for both Legacy and Mindy would be, has there been any point in working on your two different texts where it hurt? Yes, like literally, yes. Um, I'll tell you like about that. And then one thing that actually might make you laugh, but, um that there, there's a, you know, there were so many frustrations that brought me and hurt that brought me to, to write this. Um, I think it was a place of like deep rage I was in, um, at, in my studies at school. Um, and there were points in interacting with some of the, the different folks who were there and having certain discussions and realizing that actually there were there many people who were feeling that way. Um, and that, you know, actually the work that we um, were kind of being asked to do, and this is, you know, no fault of any one institution, it's institutional um, learning, I think that sometimes this is to not. Um, and so, you know, that hurt a lot, you know, thinking about the ways in which, you know, we were being asked to turn that on and off um, and as well turn it off so we are able to participate in a certain type of um, academy setting. So um, the other thing though, that, you know, is a kind of interesting counterpoint to that is I, one of the things I will never forget um, is I met someone, I ran into somebody at a party. I didn't, you know, they came up to me and they said, um, are you legacy? And I said, yeah. And they're like, this is obviously pre pandemic. Okay. Just everyone be responsible. Um, so, you know, I said, yeah. And like, this was a couple of years ago and, and they were like, oh my gosh, like, it's great to be in touch, you know, and we were talking about their work and, you know, having conversations and, you know, the idea of meeting a friend who normally you see only on the internet was one of those conversations. And they said to me this oddest thing, which has always stuck with me. They said, you're so joyful. And I thought, what a weird thing to say to somebody, right? But then I actually thought about it and I asked them, I said, why would you say that? And they were like, well, you're an academic. And I was like, that is such a deep thing to say to somebody, right? That hurt, but also was like a really interesting reminder because it is the indication that especially through the lens of black womanhood, 
that in order to prove ourselves, we have to strip ourselves of how we feel and how we react and how we emote, right? And that actually it was a surprise to this other person that that was even possible, right? And I think that the fact that they expressed that, they were not you know, in that headspace, but like the articulation of it as a surprise um, was a meeting point. It was a really important site. Um, and so I think about that often because I do think too, Olivia, especially with your work, that this idea of movement research, the ways in which we express, you know, both grief, right, and joy, um, you know, is a really strategic thing. And it's really important to think about how that can be, um, you know, made possible in all different forms as a, a core component to our research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that. Also, Olivia, I really appreciate your question. Um, I think that at the very start of Glitch Feminism, Legacy talks about a personal experience. She really grounds it in her own experience. And I did not do that for the manifesto of Cyber Fem Index, but it really was initiated because I didn't see myself reflected in a lot of the things I was researching. Um, Donna Haraway is an important figure, um, but at the time I wasn't familiar with Lisa Nakamura or Anna Singh or all of these other people. And I wanted to feel a sense of belonging because again, to bring up this idea of imposter syndrome. So I think these things constantly feeling like you're excluded and trying to carve out space is a burden. Um, and if we're able to slowly chip away at this collectively, then suddenly there will be more space. So I do think that it just, I keep, I'm gonna return to that word again. How can we do this full of care, careful? Um, I, Olivia, I don't know if you were in the room for that, but Legacy used this phrase in her book called care dash full. So it really does try to embody the sort of caring or belonging that we're adding to a group, to a group dynamic. Thank you both for your nice answers. Not nice, but like for your attention to that question. Thank you, Olivia, for the beautiful question. I think I can't think of a more appropriate way for us to close this rich and dense and lustrous conversation. Mindy and Legacy, it's been such an honor to have you with us. Um, I recommend all of you check out the Cyber Feminism Index and get your hands or your back pockets <laughs> mm -hmm. on Legacy's book. These are incredible, incredible, phenomenal contributions to the culture that we're living through and building right now. Um, if you want more information about New Inc., I'm dropping it here in the chat. Most of what we do, we talk about on our website, on our Instagram page. If you're curious about getting involved in this community, we open our call for future applicants next week and it remains open until April 20th. So lots to hear from us in that time. Um, our new drink series will continue in two weeks. We have a collaborative program with Data and Society featuring Ari Malenciano and Tricia Wang will be talking about digital collectivism and care. Might be a really nice appendix to this conversation in, in some ways. Um, and again, thank you all so much for this and seeing the love blow up in the chat. <laughs> um, feeling very, very lit up. And um, thank you again, Mindy and Legacy for the care and thought that you brought to this. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you all for being here. Mindy, I'm excited to keep talking. I know, we should definitely continue this. Well, for the, well. <laughs> for the other variations. The chat is so sweet. Thank you, everyone. And in case you missed it, do keep an eye on our, our YouTube page. We'll be posting the recording in the next few days. Cool. cool. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>